put uh, healthcare decade in India. It's a very doctor-centric presentation. Uh, then uh, we'll move on to the master talk from Prof. Acharya. Uh, I'm very glad that he has come all the way from uh, UK. Uh, I'm very happy to have him here. He's going to tell us about tips and tricks of doing a total hip replacement in an acute acetabular fracture. This is an incredible area of uh, great difficulty, and only an expert like him can handle it and uh, you know educate us about what exactly is going on in 2023. Then there'll be question and answers, and then uh, there'll be a felic felicitation of the faculties and guests of honor, and a vote of thanks and close, followed by fellowship and dinner. Uh, introducing Dr. Uh, Manisha, who is my good friend also, is a consultant orthopedic surgeon from Shah Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Manish Ramesh Shah, uh, he's a founder of Ortho 3D Company, owner of Shah Hospital, Ahmedabad. He did his MS orthopedics in 1993. He's a consultant in Kanpur till 1995. He did the Kurgan Elizaro Fellowship, which is world famous in August, 1995. He did another trauma fellowship in Moscow under Professor Oganesian. He's a passionate believer of 3D technology and orthopedics, a bit like myself. And every time I've interacted with Dr. Shah or seen him operate, you know, uh, really, you know, it sort of opened my eyes. And I learned a lot, you know, from Dr. Shah. So he's going to enlighten us today about uh, 3D augmented orthoplasty with mixed reality in orthopedics in 2023, a mind-blowing futuristic concept, which is uh, present or reality for few people in India already. Over to Dr. Shah. So Dr. Shah, welcome. Thank you very much uh, for spacing, uh, sparing your valuable time. I'll ask my team to uh, you know, offload my slides and uh, you, know, you should be able to share your slides, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Srikant, for those very, very kind words. We'll just check your audio once more, sir. So I'm not getting yes. your audio here. I'll just check for about 10 seconds, then I'll, I'll uh, you know. Can you share your slides, Dr. Shah? We can see your picture, but your slides, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you need to kindly share. We, I guess we are ready to go. Yeah. So, need yeah. is future robotics, mixed reality. Fantastic. There is Iron Man. Superhero. So uh, let's check Dr. Shah's uh, audio. And once it's uh, live here, uh -huh. we can. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Hello, Santosh. Can you check? Hello. A a am I clear? Loud enough? Hello, Dr. Shikant. Can you hear me? Dr. Shikant, can you hear Maharishi, me? Can you hear me still? Maharshi. Now we can see the slide. We can see Dr. Shah. His audio. Uh, Santosh, can you again check it? Maharshi. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Okay. So the problem is somewhere at that local site or? It, because if I'm audible to you, I'm Can you, coming like across on Zoom. Your voice are clear, sir. Your voice oh, yes. are clear. Dr. Srikant, can you hear us? Yeah, I think uh, uh, your uh, picture is coming and uh, uh, I can see the slides. Just audio, they're trying to connect here. The, the AV team is trying to connect here. Just give me 30 seconds, sir. Sure, sir. Sure. Ah, uh, Maharishi, can you speak? Yeah, I can uh, barely hear you. We're just trying to increase the volume, sir. Yeah, okay. picture is, I can see the okay. picture. See yeah. you. Uh, your volume is a uh, little bit on 10%. We're trying to increase the volume. Just to give us 20 seconds. Once your volume is full, I will, I'll, I'll let you. Okay, okay. Apologies for the technical hitch. Yeah, I've got a pleasure of three technical people helping me. Yeah, can you speak, sir, again? Okay. Uh, uh, you are, you are uh, live. Uh, so I will uh, I will clear my space and then uh, leave it to you, sir. 
podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Dr. Shrikan. And uh, without much ado, let's get to the topic. As we all know, robotics uh, is classified as active and passive robots. Active robots are the ones which use a hiptic arm. Passive, where robotics is performed with handheld instruments. The other classification being image-free robotics, wherein no pre-op imaging is used, and image-based robotics, wherein a CT-based or an X-ray-based 3D planning is performed prior to going in for surgery. What are the most popular ones at present? We are seeing the initial ones that came in were passive or handheld instruments. And now most of the new robots which are coming in use a heptic arm. Similarly, the initial ones were image-free robotics, but at present, we are seeing a flux of CT-based uh, image planning with robotics. What are the steps that we normally uh, go through in robotics? The first is uh, a CT scan is taken and an image-based 3D planning is performed. Then computer navigation is performed to align that 3D bone model to the native bone. And then robotic tools are used to effect cuts. In image-less robotics, computer navigation is performed first. An image of the bone is developed from the landmark selected by computer navigation. 3D planning, once again, is done but then this is done inside the OT and then robotic tools are used to affect the cuts. With 3D planning, as we have seen, navigation based landmark selection can have errors. And that is why most robotic systems to date rely on image-based or CT-based 3D planning. CT-based image acquisition is the most popular method. X-rays to 3D is the next frontier. But the basic problem that lies is that most of these existing systems have a company product specialist who's handling the 3D planning. Surgeons generally play the role only of approving a prefixed plan. Will this 3D printing and planning take away the surgical planning from doctors? This was an excellent editorial published in the Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma way back in 2018. And the answer lies in this paper, which says that it is important for the surgeon to plan because significant changes of the technician plan were necessary to get an accurate preoperative plan. No major changes of the surgeon plan were necessary. A blind reply to the technician plan may not be recommended. So here we show how 3D planning opens up avenues to view a lot of other parameters which are generally missed during a routine computer navigation. It is possible to move the image all throughout it's possible to plan and see where the sulcus line falls in, look at the position of the tibial keel, check for varus valgus, look at the anterior condylar offset, look at the posterior condylar offsets and the posterior joint overhang, look at the component positions. With this, it's possible even to look at mid flexion instability. 
How? Uh, uh, just, yes. When one looks at the implant and the uh, margin of the native bone, if there is a lot of bone protruding here, this would mean that the implant is going way back during mid flexion, and this will give lead. This will lead to a mid flexion instability. One look. One can analyze the tibial component slope, the position of the keel, place the implant in the desired position, place check the rotation of the tibia. Effectively perform a virtual surgery before going in. That's the beauty of 3D planning. It allows you to analyze and look at all the factors and look at even the bony gap balancing. As during the CT acquisition, the patella is in its natural position. It is possible to see how the implant will interact with the patella. Thus, it's possible to look at a personalized alignment for an individual. It's possible to look at a personalized implant from available off-the-shelf implants. It frees the surgeon from the hegemony of an fixed implant company planning. The next step is computer navigation during surgery. Basically, computer navigation is the eyes of the robot. As we can see, all systems will have a navigation which will guide the robot in the desired position. Most robots at present have passive trackers and cameras. With this, there will always be line of sight issues. So what would be a desirable thing? It's a wearable device, head mounted camera, display within the glasses. Hence, no line of sight issues. Trackers with either QR codes or images. The advantage being that there's almost zero footprint in the OT. All cameras, sensors, display panel, and computer are in a single headset with Wi-Fi connectivity. No addition of disposables and its costs. One can relay live surgery remotely. These wearable de devices follow voice commands and hence it becomes fairly gadget free inside the OT. Pre-op planning can be taken in as an augmented reality setup. I'll take a minute here, step back and try and explain these terms. There's virtual reality, there's augmented reality and there is mixed reality. Virtual reality is wherein when you wear those glasses, you are cut off from the outside world. You're looking only at the virtual world through those glasses. That's virtual reality. It's like a cinema hall type of experience. The next is augmented reality, wherein you can, through those glasses, you can see your surroundings. At the same time, there is some information coming in to your glasses from the outside. And then comes mixed reality, wherein th that information which is coming in is working in tandem with the outside world and mixing the two realities. 
that is how it can work as a tracking device, as a navigating device. Augmented reality headsets alone will not work as navigating devices because they can only pass on information. They cannot work in tandem with the outside world. The other advantage of these headsets is having a multiplayer format. So both the surgeon and the assistant can wear one and both would have different views, improving accuracy, improving speed. This is from the eyes of someone wearing a HoloLens. The information you see here is what is augmented reality. You're seeing where to place the point or the for the anatomic landmark and the axis that you get to see is mixed reality wherein you'll be able to have an axis which is superimposing on yeah there you have a virtual bone model superimposing on the real bone We also have instruments which work like patient specific instruments, modular patient specific instruments without the need for an intramedullary intervention. And we perform a cross check with the HoloLens. Thus, if we were to review the steps of robotics, image based 3D planning. But then, yes, we have a surgeon controlled 3D planning, which is independent of an implant company, allows you to pick and choose the best fit implant for that patient, the best fit position and individualized alignment for that patient. Navigation, a wearable device with zero footprint. Moving to cutting tools. Is there a need for a heptic app in knee replacements? Heptic arms are helpful for keyhole surgeries. PKR is an 8 to 10 inch incision. Difficult anatomic locations or very minute suturing like a difficult position in the abdomen wherein someone is doing an intestinal anastomosis, a heptic arm definitely would be helpful. But in a TKR where everything is front, right in front of your eyes and the smallest suture used is probably number one, I'm not sure of how much a heptic arm would add to surgeon efficiency. And more importantly, the joy of surgery. I like the sound and the feel of the saw in my hand. It's like the cool wind in my hair. So it's time that we start taking back the 3D planning and ensuring that we have platforms wherein surgeons themselves do the 3D planning. Where is the accuracy coming from? Is it coming from 3D planning? Is it coming from computer navigation? Is it coming from robotic tools? This was an excellent meta-analysis on shoulder arthroplasty. They compared patient-specific 3D templating or planning versus the use of patient-specific instruments themselves. And what did they find? No significant differences between 3D planning and patient-specific instruments, although both improved accuracy significantly. What they hypothesized was that 3D 
preoperative planning can possibly make the surgeons more cognizant of deformity such that they make subtle adjustments based on their plan that actually increases the surgical accuracy versus the use of the physical guide itself. This is a recent report from the Australian registry. It's really worthwhile going through it, pages 266 and 267, wherein technology-aided knee replacements are discussed. What did they find? That in more than 65 years of age, there is a lower rate of revision after six months with navigation and less than 65 years of age, there is lower rate of revision with navigation. With robotics, more than 65 years of age, there's a lower rate of revision with robotics. Less than 65 years of age, there's no difference. It's interesting to note that in the UKR section, they have noted that the lack of uh, difference in revision rates is that the number of revisions for malalignment, malpositioning and loosening are much less with technology aided surgery, but the infection rates are higher probably because of more time consumed in surgery. So if you were to look at both the contribution in terms of accuracy and cost, 3D planning probably provides the highest in terms of accuracy and is at the least cost. Cutting tools probably do not add so much to accuracy, but definitely add a huge amount to cost. So when we talk of HoloLens robotics, it's man versus man machine. We want to create a robot from the surgeon himself, have a surgeon-centric, patient-centric system, not an implant company-centric system. The accuracy from very, very precise planning by the surgeon, personalized alignment and personalization of implants from the available off-the-shelf implants. Everything is right there in front of surgeon's eyes. The surgeon is able to see the virtual bone and the native bone, both superimposed on each other. He's able to see the axis. He just needs to use the saw on that axis converts a surgeon to a superhero. That is where mixed reality will take us. That is the future of joint replacement. Thank you. Over to you, Shrikan. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, thanks for a mind-blowing presentation, really. Really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, uh, any questions uh, uh, from the audience here? Uh, uh, Prof. Astaria, do you have any questions for uh, Dr. Manish Shah? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Um, lovely. Uh, yeah, I can translate this. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, so. Uh, yeah, fascinated how we can make surgery more reproducible, more reliable, more accurate um, without the cost, as you say. So um, you mentioned that it's open to all implants um, and not company biased or company specific. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of arthroplasty, but do a lot of trauma as well. Um, and so my um, thought process is, is taking it into the trauma side as well and using it for, for the trauma side of things, um, adapting that. And do you think that's possible to do that? Yes, it would be. 
we are still finding our feet with mixed reality and still finding all possible applications. Uh, as we all know, probably joint replacement is the easiest part of orthopedics. And uh, that is why it lends itself so easily to technology. Uh, with and see, uh, imaging now is uh, one of the basic investigations for complex trauma. Hence, 3D planning and its utilization with a mixed reality setup is not too far away. Probably, I would feel six to 12 months is a rough time for getting a proof of concept and maybe another year or so for commercialization, but not beyond that. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, from the audience? Dr. Raghavendra, you got any questions? Srikanth, you've been with orthoplasty industry for a very long time. So yeah, he has got that. Uh, uh, can you pass on the mic to uh, Mr. Srikanth, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Manish. Good evening. Uh, very, very interesting uh, discussion we are having on, uh, you know, the 3D part. Uh, what amazes me is, well, first of all, I'm not a doctor. So, so I've been in the arthroplasty segment for quite some time. Uh, so my question is more specific in terms of uh, today, I think there's a big, big wave in terms of the robotics coming in place in orthopedics, particularly in the joint replacement segment. Uh, however, the what, what I feel is the disadvantage is that I think uh, each of these companies which are having the robotic system, I think they are only kind of aligning their knee design to the robot. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't become a versatile kind of an option. Uh, whereas uh, with whatever little I have understood from your talk, I guess your, your system is a versatile system. Uh, therefore, uh, surgeons can probably pick and choose the most appropriate implant, which is suitable to, uh, you know, different types of patients. So would you yes. think that would be a great advantage in your side? Definitely, definitely. And what I feel is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my last uh, uh, part of the talk, the accuracy comes in from the planning itself. In terms of uh, cutting tools, I I'm not sure of how much they contribute to the accuracy overall or the long-term survivorship of a joint. So uh, I would feel that this uh, represents the best of the two, wherein you have a non-implant company centric planning, the feasibility of choosing the best joint and the best position for a patient, and then taking that planning into the OR, uh, making the surgeon semi-robotic uh, and getting him to perform the same process probably will be the future. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, Dr. Manish, I had one question. So you mentioned about uh, mid-flexion instability. Uh, yes. I mean, so with all the 3D work that you have done, uh, is it uh, more sort of implant related or is it a knee phenotype related? What exactly is causing uh, mid-flexion instability? Uh, it's, see, the thing is that, as we all know that, each knee is a little different. And that is why when we try and fix one particular design, for each and every knee, there will be some wherein you'll be able to match it for extension and flexion, but you'll not be able to match it for the full uh, curvature of the condyle. And that is where that mid flexion instability comes in because then the native bone is like this and your implant goes like this. So that this gap in between will lead to mid flexion instability. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience here? Yeah. Uh, before I let you off, just one last uh, question. I'm really fascinated sure. pre paraoperative and post operative protocols. When I visited you recently at Ahmedabad, can you kindly share it? Uh, there are many junior uh, surgeons here, a few fellows as well. So if you can kindly enlighten them what exactly is your pre para and post operative protocols for your TKR patients. Thank you. Uh, the normal post-op protocol is that we get them up by, uh, I mean, uh, 
almost all my surgeries are scheduled for the morning and we get them up and about in the evening itself they're moving well the next day and the earlier we mobilize them it is much much easier for the patient much much easier uh, in preventing stiffness which normally accompanies uh, these surgeries uh, we normally use a subvastus approach and um, liberally use the ranavat cocktail allows us to get uh, a multimodal analgesia and gives uh, makes the patient much more comfortable in complying with early mobilization so uh, i guess that's the but then uh, it's this is not uh, a protocol which i would say that uh, is uh, something very different from what is being practiced in most centers all over the world yeah uh moving thank you so much uh, dr shah uh, thanks for enlightening us thank you and uh, yeah just a, a sort of uh, a certificate of uh, thank you and appreciation from sssc for your uh, valuable time and contribution guidance to the medical community thank you so much uh, from all of thank us thank you hope to see you soon okay thank you thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. so we will uh, move to the next part of the presentation this is something uh, you know i really like it uh, you know and since the covid time i've been very uh, passionate about it and every meet the masters we have uh, done this uh, creativity corner and lateral thinking and uh, you know uh, it sort of it gives a solution to the lot of vexing problems the world is facing uh, the interpersonal problems that human beings can have with each other and uh, it's it's, a, it's a, certainly opened my eyes and covid certainly opened my eyes and um, it said that around 20% of activities only give around uh, uh, you know 80% satisfaction so that means 80% activities don't give uh, satisfaction to the human beings uh, it's well researched that a 5 year old uh, uh you know child has got 98% creativity compared to adult who has got only 2% creativity this is from the classic paper from uh, george land at bed german in 1993 psychologists have repeatedly proved or shown that 98% of adult thoughts are useless and repetitive when someone does say mountain climbing you know these kind of useless and repetitive thoughts are suppressed for example if i am bungee jumping or mountain climbing you know i can't think about what did i have for my breakfast yesterday because i'll be dead next second i need to be in the moment in the presence or in the zone as they call it so this leads to a kind of thoughtlessness or in a thoughtless state and uh, you know that leads to peace and hence you know many people are addicted to these extreme sports because every time they go the you know mind is suppressed a thoughtless state is created and that's enjoyable so when it comes to performance acceleration the paradox is for greater impact we have to slow down enough to reflect on what we have done and where we are going this is uh, from hegel wood et al uh, i think uh, it took several decades for me to understand what's the real meaning of a human being the being is a creative wise conscious self you know representing unity and oneness uh, you know uh, among all of us while the human is the form of the physical world and by its very nature has multiple multiplicity and unity is impossible uh, as you know no two human beings are same you know either genetically or agree with each other many times uh, and that's due to the human ego and ego seems to be the root of all the human problems really if you look at all conflicts at home or at work it's all uh, ego derived uh thinking plays a subordinate part in the decisive phase of creative work why, why majority of scientists are not creative is not because they don't know how to think but because they don't know how to stop thinking so there's a fam famous example of archimedes the eureka moment when he was relaxing in a bathtub when you know the real thing flashed to him and he was very happy and he discovered something new so uh, i think finding the stop but button to our mind is the basic uh, you know secret behind happiness or nirvana so uh, so from going to science to metaphysics to creativity so uh, once uh, such talk uh, about innovation creativity is from uh, you know uh, we learn something new from uh, both the next two talks actually i think uh, next talk is being done by myself 
So uh, I will uh, do that, share that slide, and then I'll come back to Prof. Acharya and introduce uh, him to you. So if you can uh, unshare this and go back to the other presentation, please. So this uh, presentation is slightly modified. It was uh, like a non-medical talk, a very kind of doctor-centric talk because we're all doctors here, majority of us. And, uh, you know, I thought I will add a little bit of uh, orthopedics, uh, which is part and parcel of me as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening uh, in 2023 in orthoplasty, just a few slides, then go to that uh, core topic. So, <clears throat> yeah, what's new in orthoplasty 2023? Uh, I see many new faces here uh, whom I don't know or who probably don't uh, know me. At the outset, uh, I would like to say, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So I welcome uh, all um, uh, the delegates who have come here for this first international meet uh, uh, of this year from our center. Uh, uh, many of you joined late here. Uh, so I see a lot of new faces. So it's my duty to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Srikant. Okay, and I <clears throat> train in UK in all aspects of orthopedics and trauma. I have special interest in uh, computer-assisted uh, robotic knee hip surgery and patient-specific implants. I did a, a fellowship uh, which was recognized by General Medical Council in Plymouth Teaching Hospitals uh, doing uh, close to 400, 500 navigation surgeries. And I also have a specialist interest in hip and knee, uh, uh, you know, sports and revision surgery. I did a fellowship uh, in Avon Orthopedic Center, and I was with Prof. Acharya there in Avon Orthopedic Center in Bristol. And also have a passion for uh, septic revision or infected revision surgery, uh, where we take the infected implant out and try to put it in the same sitting. And, uh, you know, this is uh, following my fellowship in endoclinic with Prof. Garka, is one of the world authorities on single stage infected uh, revision. So I'm both a UG and postgraduate from the prestigious Bangalore Medical College uh, Research Center uh, here in Bangalore, our uh, National Merit Scholar Throat. And uh, with a lot of experience and, uh, you know, very uh, happy to have worked in four out of five specialist hospitals in the UK where I picked up all the tips and tricks uh, as I went along. I'm also director of the International Meet the Ma Masters course. We are into the sixth year this year. And also I'm India coordinator of uh, the Bristol Lip Orthoplastic course, which many of us, more than 1,000 surgeons, enjoyed uh, last year with the help of IMA Bangalore as well. Uh, first, you know, gratefulness to my teachers. Without my teachers, I, I would not be standing uh, here. Our uh, good old Indian tradition says, uh, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwarha. So, you know, uh, let me start with the big ones. Uh, you know, very grateful to Prof. Alistair Hart, uh, standing on my right side, uh, who was part of uh, one of the Meet the Masters course where Dr. Manish was involved and Dr. Uh, 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 you know, Mehul Acharya was uh, involved, but he had surgery at that time. And then, uh, you know, Dr. Everett Smith was involved. And I'm flanked here by Dr. Dr. John Skinner, who was an ex-British uh, Orthopedic Association uh, president, and we truly had a you know three you know futuristic talk about 3D printing and orthopedics. And there's a very exciting debate uh, between my mentor, Dr. Everett Smith, and uh, Professor Alistair Hart, which was quite interesting, really, and eye opener for me. And uh, this is uh, with Dr. Jonathan Keenan. Uh, you know, I owe all my uh, navigation and robotic uh, skills to him. Uh, he saw, was the director of orthoplasty at the Plymouth Teaching Hospitals, uh, teaching me the basics of uh, navigated surgery. And uh, in fact, at the end of fellowship, they nicknamed me Sri the Knee because of my passion for knee. And, uh, you know, we talk about creativity. This is actually done by his daughter, you know, who took Sachin Tendulkar's body, my head, and a cricket bat and a revision knee implant says, look at this creativity in a 16-year-old girl. So this also creativity is important. So, uh, uh, you know, I can't thank enough my mentor for hips, uh, Dr. Everett Smith. He was a UK head of European Hip Society when I was working with him and also director of Bristol Lip Orthoplastic Course. Uh, and Mr. Anthony Ward, who's a director of pelvic and surgery, uh, who trained Prof. Acharya also, uh, my gratefulness to uh, them. And uh, uh, this is when I met uh, Prof. Acharya first time in Bristol, uh, this in the Bristol Marriott uh, Hotel. And, uh, you know, this is uh, when uh, Mr. Everett Smith came to India first time, you know, uh, the spare approach for hip was new. And uh, we had opportunity to uh, get on and do the first spare approach in India. Uh, on the left hand side, you do that being done in the only day Institute of uh, Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And this is the inaugural Meet the Masters course in uh, uh, Hotel Lee Meridian uh, on the right side. I was just uh, showing Prof. Acharya on the way from the airport today that sadly the hotel is shut now. So it's quite interesting. So uh, uh, this is the endoclinic with Prof. Garka. Uh, he's a world-renowned authority on single-stage uh, revision with, along with uh, Dr. Javed Parvezi, uh, you know, a great surgeon. 
And, uh, you know, this is my knee mentor, Dr. Richard Parkinson, uh, who was a British Knee Society president from 2014 to 2016. My very first job in UK happened to be with him. So that's how uh, I got inspired in knee surgery. He was also voted uh, top 10 best knee replacement surgeons in the UK and trainers. Uh, this is uh, with Dr. Frederick Lord uh, uh, in Tours, Paris. I think uh, Prof. Acharya also visited. Uh, we want to go together, but uh, we couldn't meet him together. We went separately. Uh, Frederick is a pioneer in anterior approach to the hip and uh, conducts a beautiful cadaveric course uh, like this, where we learn tips and tricks of doing an anterior approach uh, to the hip, which is still a fascination in India, picking up in the last five, six years. And uh, yeah, extensively, I uh, had the uh, uh, opportunity to interact with Zimo surgeons, uh, Prof. Wayne Proprosky, whom I met in Nottingham. He doesn't need introduction. All the establer fractures are named after him. He classified it. So the whole world knows his name. And Dr. Lawrence O'Hara, a big revision surgeon in Bournemouth, and uh, Dr. Jeremy Latham. Uh, this is with Lawrence, and this is with uh, Jeremy Latham. And, um, you know, uh, so just briefly about, uh, you know, what's, what's new really. So we know about uh, totally replacement. Uh, for some of us, uh, computer navigation or robotics, uh, 3D augmented knee surgery are new. Uh, we still have uh, uh, this alignment versus balance uh, in the knee. What is important? That conundrum is still going on. And all these modern technologies, uh, you know, they all lead to predictable accuracy, make surgery safer for our patients and recordable, you know, and data, as you know, is a new gold, really. And it prepares better surgeons of tomorrow as it leads to transparency, uh, future learning and accountability in medical practice, which is very, very important. And they all act like a patient-specific knee because now we know that now all knees are not same. Now we are in the era of uh, phenotypic knees, which I'll mention. So, uh, yeah, definitely the knees are of a uh, uh, number of variety. So what's new in 2023? See, the artificial intelligence or machine-based uh, enabled robot or the bot is a new thing. It's not present in India. The knee phenotypes are coming in a big way. Uh, 81 knee phenotypes have been described. And the dynamic knee balancing, the concept of dynamic knee balancing and the treatment based on them is a, a pioneering field which is coming. What is the role of the sacral slope, the pelvic incidence, the pelvic tilt, and the spinopelvic tilt on cup placement in hip surgery? Uh, Prof. Acharya gave a master talk and went into detail in the last year's Meet the Masters uh, program. Uh, what is the role of the patient positioning? You know, uh, level balancing, do we need to use it in OT, uh, good OT supports? What about smart sensors and smart retractors? You know, they will be uh, become increasingly important uh, in the coming days. And day surgery in orthoplasty, UK, it's almost, uh, you know, it's been forced by COVID actually. Uh, India, I only heard about a center or two uh, trying to uh, practice that. And uh, yeah, regenerative medicine technology, like the joint widow, which uh, our SSOC launched in Karnataka for the first time, you know, is becoming very, very important. And I was just discussing with Prof. Acharya, it's extensively used in London as well. And uh, it's based on the, you know, uh, SVF, which is uh, stromal vascular factor. Then the soft tissue algorithm in knee surgery, you know, that's also becoming a very, very uh, important and futuristic uh, thing. And we just discussed now augmented reality and mixed reality in orthobreaks. We understood the difference. And uh, we had a master talk from uh, Dr. Manish, who is into these technologies for quite a long time now. So coming to this, uh, uh, today's my topic, actually, the start of the healthcare decade in India, this is a non-medical kind of uh, topic, but very relevant to the doctors because I'm very passionate about doctors because I uh, personally uh, feel that the doctor and the patient is at the center of the healthcare. So the patient is somebody who has got pain, say maybe he has knee pain or hip pain or whatever. He comes to the doctor, okay? And the doctor has the solution for it. If you talk in business sense, then the patient has a pain point. Okay, that's what business people talk about. And the solution is given by the doctor. So if there is a knee pain, the doctor may say, okay, take paracetamol. Or if it's severe, he may say, okay, it's too severe. You need a diamorphine or a morphine injection. Or if it's severe knee pain, he will say, okay, I'll inject intraarticular uh, steroid or a joint widow. Or he would say, I will do a, a knee replacement or a robotic or a augmented reality robotic, whatever, a hollow lens robotic. So that is at the core of medicine in the world. But increasingly, we feel that uh, both the doctor and the patient, you know, in all these uh, 100 bedded, 1,000 bedded, 2,000 bedded hospitals, they get completely the corner and everybody else becomes so much more important. And we are always at the corner and that is not correct. And as doctors, I think we should be at the center of this doctor-patient relationship and we should drive all other businesses around this relationship, which is very, very important. So what is this uh, healthcare decade? COVID-19 pandemic you know, has been a game changer. Uh, I think before pandemic, if you look at India, 
the very important industries were uh, you know the construction industries uh, the infrastructure the itbt airlines hospitality defense etc uh, sometimes they attract 10% of gdp you know defense health was a neglected field uh, for the past 70 plus years uh, in india and a lot of people have only given lip service to it and no real improvements has happened on the ground level uh, health illiteracy and apathy in the public and natas was the reason for the above situation leading to less than 1% gdp spend on the health uh, you know, from successive government. And this spend was less than uh, con uh, SAR countries like Sri Lanka. And we know now Sri Lanka is in very big uh, you know, financial trouble. Come COVID, the world changed, the world stopped. The airline industry stopped, hospitality had to be grounded. It was almost unthinkable. You ask any businessman, Trump, will you stop airlines? He would say, not in a million years. Every business was shut, including place of worship, except hospitals. COVID second wave, as all of you know, was the last straw on the camel's back. We do not face such horrors. I have many of my anesthetic colleagues are here and you know, they are in the front line of fighting this menace. And it was, you know, uh, for all of us, it was such a, it's like a horror movie, like a deja vu, you know, like a groundhog day. If you've seen the movie, every day you wake up, the same lockdown, same thing, you know, what's happening? Like, every day is the same thing. So it was just like uh, we were, we were uh, perpetually trapped in a horror movie. And, you know, for many, like my anesthetic colleagues, it's much worse than, you know, we uh, were doing uh, most of the elective kind of work. Wealthy people dying on streets with no ambulance, no oxygen, no beds, and no medicines, you know, almost unheard of. For the first time, the powerful stakeholders felt helpless in front of a submicroscopic RNA virus. This virus indeed brought the whole world to its knees. Their power, money, sphere of influence, connects and contacts no longer mattered when the triad started. When the triad started, a doctor had to decide who's going to live, who's going to die. It was not depending on the bank balance of the person, patient coming. It just depended on who needed more medical priority. So doctors were really gods. No argument there. So in 2023, a doctor has to work very hard to fail. The strongest demand for healthcare workers and India is waking up to the importance of its doctors and healthcare workers. Indian healthcare shot up from 200 billion US dollars in 2020 to almost double in two years time. This was due to the helplessness from COVID second wave, increased forced awareness, increased disposable income of people from ITPT sector, children who uh, the kids were abroad with a good uh, disposable income, increasing lifestyle diseases like arthritis, osteoporosis, world diabetic capital. Sad Sadly, India has got the distinction of all this so are diabetic capital of the world, cancer capital of the world, hypertension capital of the world, stroke capital of the world, and myocardial infection capital of the world. I was discussing with my colleagues who moved back from UK, the interventional cardiologists. They were telling me, Sri, I'm putting stents at the average age of 27, almost unheard of. In West, it's 45, 50. But here, because of so much of smoking and alcoholism, uh, children are getting stents at 27. And accident capital. So for those who are from Bangalore, I don't need to expand what is Potaluru. You all know what it stands for. So I'll just stop there. Increased insurance penetration, including government schemes. Long COVID is an elephant in the room and no one has time to even discuss that. If you are an entrep entrepreneur, you know, never was a better time to invest in healthcare than now. The need of the hour is a partnership between doctors, engineers, basic scientists, investors, designers, patients, and their families and entrepreneurs. We are in this post-COVID mess together. So the start of the healthcare decade, India, you know, uh, most populous nation in the world uh, by June 2023. I was just discussing this morning with Prof. Acharya. So I think, uh, you know, uh, technically we have overtaken China now. But uh, by June 2023, it's official that we are number one most populous country in the world. China is number two. 70% of this population is uh, between 18 to 64. That is a workable age group. So we all know the meaning of that. That means more income to the country. 25 crore youth are present in the country. So you ask the youth, you know, my son is in that age, you know, that's consumption economy. You can't stop youth from spending. They'll say, dad, just give me money. I want to spend. That's it. The CAGR in health is minimum 17%. If you compare that with gold, it's 5% gold. And even company like Infosys, you know, it's around 10%. The government of India, you know, is going to increase GDP spend on health to 3% by around 2025. 
There are a lot of mergers and acquisitions, deals happening. All of you have seen how Manipal almost gobbled up a lot of hospitals in Bangalore, including Columbia. And just last week, Manipal got gobbled by a Singapore-based hospital. So you just can see the merger and acquisition, what's happening. PM Modi wants one medical college in every district. Increased manpower need is there, and that need is going to increase. The government of India wants India as a global healthcare hub. The finance minister is uh, planning to increase the health budgetary allocation as well. In the run-up to 2024 elections, you know, this will shoot up definitely because it's a matter of retaining power. So the healthcare decade has started and the decade means 10 years, but, you know, they have predicted the graph. The decade is not going to reach peak even in 2050. That means even it's 2050, is the curve is like that. It's not going to flatten. So in the next five decades, you can call it. So you really have to work hard to fail. So Modi has said that India uh, to get record number of new doctors in upcoming uh, 10 years. And he said that the central government plan is to establish a medical college in every district. As a doctor, what knowledge uh, should you be equipped with to ride this wave? You know, post COVID, the CAGR in health is minimum 16 to 17%. The basic fund about healthcare, you know, next 10 years, as they say, particularly next three years, uh, they're calling it as a healthcare decade. We have to change this fixed cost, you know, land cost to variable cost by renting or leasing. Uh, because the fixed cost, if you have a land, that's fine, you're done. But if you don't have, then 40% of healthcare cost comes from the land. Banks don't want good doctors. Banks want, a, you know, rosy detailed project report. So you need to create a detailed project report, one for yourself is honest, one a rosy one for the bank. And 75% money you get from the bank and 25% is should be your own investment. Appoint essential workflows like anesthetists and medics plus multitaskers. A mix of talent, 30% experience and 20%, 70% freshers is a good plan. Have a vision statement. And that's the most important thing. Why do I wake up every morning? And you need to have an answer for that. Why do I wake up every morning? So I think, you know, you need to write down the vision statement. You need to say, I'm going to make, say, 30 lakhs per month by, say, 15 February 2025. Uh, 2024, you know, it's a uh, Valentine's Day. It could be your wife or girlfriend's birthday also. And, you know, that means 3.6 crores per annum. Make a card, okay, and stick that card in your pocket, in your bathroom. Every day when you wake up, you see that card, read it, you know, and read your vision statement. It's very important. Without vision statement, you can't go far. Venture into medical devices, innovation, manufacturing, nano masks, new syringes, vacuum cleaners, new beds, hospital x-rays, COVID suits, cheap and workable. You know what is best for the patients, not the manufacturers. They come from an engineering background. You are a doctor. There's a lot of money in telemedicine and digital marketing, and they can act as a source of income, particularly passive income. It's very, very important. Have a mentor, a mentor for business, a mentor for personal growth, a mentor for spiritual growth. Remember, you have to work hard to fail in India as a doctor now. Come out of your comfort zone. You know, Take calculated risk. Get investors, friends, family to be part of your vision. Tie up with radiology, pathology, form of additional source of income. Smoothly execute the below 12 points. Avoid analysis paralysis. That is too much overthinking is not going to help. So first you need to have a vision statement that, you know, this particular date, I'll have a 50 bedded hospital. This is a, you know, 30 lakhs per month. It will be my monthly income. So many crores I'm going to earn in a year. Second, have the path. What is the path that you want to take? You know, 90% you need to be focused on earning, 5% you have to do surveys. We are doctors, 5% you have to do philanthropy. Don't try to reverse that. Location of the place is also important for people in Bangalore. You have to use posher locations and create a LLP, which is quite uh, safe for you. And financial management is very important. As I said, the DPR detail project report, one for your own and one rosy one for the bank. And get an architect to plan, uh, you know, your, your project. And if you're having HR, try to get them two months before the start. And tie up on diagnostics and pharma is important. And get the statutory approvals. They're not difficult. They're straightforward. Everything is streamlined now and online. And do competitive analysis. You don't want to put your hospital next to a big corporate spending millions of uh, rupees. And start, you know, don't get into paralysis. So the healthcare decade is here. Thanks to COVID, uh, you know, as they say, every cloud has a silver lining. The Indian population realized that without doctors, their business will go kaput, which ha happened in the last three years. Health is wealth is drilled into Indian psyche in the last three years. The need of the hour is a partnership between doctors, engineers, basic scientists, investors, designers, patients, and their families, because we are in this together. To get more than what you have, you have to become more than what you are. 
have smart goals that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals. People buy <clears throat> why you do than what you do. Remember, money loves speed, no analysis paralysis. System works, people fail. Always remember that. Have systems which work and <clears throat> have a checklist for everything. If you look at the Indian history, around 45,000 Britishers ruled around 1 crore Indians and they ruled because they had checklists and SOPs. Always remember SSC, that is System, Standard Operating Procedure and Checklist. So I welcome any questions. So, you know, particularly juniors uh, here sitting, they can, uh, they can ask any questions. I just end with this uh, thought of the day. Lucky means who get the opportunity. Brilliant means who create the opportunity. And winner means who uses the opportunity. So thank you for your patient listening. Uh, any questions is there? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, being a junior and uh, I finished my orthopedics uh, recently and uh, I mean still in dilemma to what to do with my future. So uh, shall I start my own clinic? Shall I join another hospital? Shall I go under a mentor? Or shall I join into an academic college? Or uh, you know practice on my own? So it's a uh, very huge competition in uh, Bangalore. And as you know, and uh, it's very much a dilemma after uh, post graduation. What to do next? Maybe shall I go to a fellowship uh, to uh, hire my studies? So it's a big dilemma. So even if, if I finish my fellowship in some uh, super speciality, I'm back to zero again, starting from zero again. Yeah. So, so I think uh, that's a true dilemma for many of the uh, doctors and many of the postgraduates, really. So I think. Uh, as far as I know, your path is set. So, uh, you know, there's not to worry. But I'm answering for other people. So I think uh, if you're a junior, you just passed your exam. Uh, you need to really uh, complete your training. So training is not three years. I used to be with Professor Jaike Reddy. He was a HOD of orthopedics in Victoria Hospital. He used to always say, you know, in three years of MS, you can't learn everything. You know, even training in UK is for six years. There's a good reason why it is six years, you know. And the training is a long process. Uh, sadly, in India, the trainees don't get paid well. Uh, but at, at least UK, they are facing similar problems. But at least you get paid well compared to the trainees in India. So... Uh, you know, you need to train yourself. When you uh, train yourself, reach the pinnacle of your training, uh, then, you know, opportunities come behind you rather than you running behind and uh, all these dynamos will disappear. So I think you need to come back as an expert uh, whom nobody can refuse, you know. So that, that's what uh, the level you need to reach. And hard work is the answer. You know, there's no shortcut. You know, there's uh, no shortcut to anything in life. And, you know, uh, yeah, juniors uh, always uh, think differently. Why should we work hard? And all my son thinks like that. So I can see that. But uh, yeah, I don't think there is any shortcut to hard work, really. Uh, Follow-ups. Uh, with uh, now introduction of the AI, so everything is getting easier. Uh, so I think uh, the, in the field of orthopedics and it's uh, newer compared to other fields. So the new technologies are going to come and the big shots above us are going to go uh, earlier than us than the junior doctors so uh, even after being an expert in the subject and uh, comp competing with the other uh, senior doctors i think it's uh, kind of tough and uh, how to go about that i mean say um, it's actually the opposite if you ask all the senior doctors they hate technology and i know many hospitals in bangalore where they bought a robot the senior surgeon doesn't want to use it because he's he doesn't like it Okay, it is guys like you who will adapt to AR, mixed reality, and you are, you are going to be the pioneers, and you're going to create something new, okay, which is not even existing now, and you are going to drive that wave, and your seniors can't compete with that, okay, because you know you come from the area of innovation and creativity, not from uh, you know. So you uh, know, I know look, many seniors don't use WhatsApp. They say no, no, it keeps on making sound. I don't like it. But without WhatsApp, we can't even leave. So that's the uh, thing. So I think the juniors have an advantage. Yeah. Any your thoughts, Prof. Acharya, and uh, how Thank you, as juniors should create a career? Yeah, I, I, um, I think it's the other way around as well. I think it's an exciting opportunity for the juniors. I think it, it's tough. It's tough for everyone. But for you guys, um, it's an exciting opportunity. You look at um, what Sri said. So. Uh, how much innovation has come in a short period of time? So you, when I was training, you had very little innovation in that 10-year decade. But actually, in the last two, three, four years, 
there's been so much change. And as Sri said, you know, when you're at the middle, when you're at the peak of your career, okay, um, it's difficult to take on extra things. You're there, you're doing everything you want to do. So it's difficult to take on extra things. The time to take on extra things um, is, is, is at your stage. So I think, you know, it's tough, um, but it's also a challenge and an opportunity for you guys. So I think if you can take the opportunity with, with two hands and some of the things that Sri mentioned, you know, identifying um, goals and your goals might be small, but make sure you tick them. You've achieved them. You've moved on to the next goal. But also have a guru, as he said, as Sri said, you know, have a guru, have a have a mentor who is going to guide you along that path. You're not on your own. You've got lots of people who have done that path before. So learn from their mistakes that they've made or learn from them and use them to guide you through. So those are the words I would say. Is that it's an opportunity. Make the most of it and use your guide. Thanks, Dr. Shalshan. Thank you very much. Any other questions from other doctors who have joined? Okay. So that's great. So, um, yeah. So I think we'll uh, go to the uh, uh, final presentation. Uh, last but not the least, as they say. So if you put me my slide, I'll just introduce Prof. Acharya. Uh, and then we can share his slides. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so it's uh, my distinct pleasure uh, here to introduce uh, Prof. Mehul Acharya. Uh, uh, Prof. Acharya, uh, very grateful for him to come all the way from uh, you know uh, UK uh, to India and to Bangalore. Uh, I know he's got a busy schedule in the next couple of days as well. Uh, he's a professor of orthopedics at uh, Wales uh, Adrian Bivan University. Uh, you know, uh, he's incidentally the ninth person in the history of uh, IOA to get the honorary fellowship. Uh, it is happening in uh, Lucknow uh, this year's uh, IOA, uh, uh, you know, celebrations uh, in December. Uh, he's a dynamic orthopedic consultant from the North Bristol NHS Trust, one of the busiest uh, major level one trauma centers in the UK. He specializes in uh, pelvic acetabular reconstruction, complex trauma and complex hip and knee reconstruction. Uh, he did fellowship in complex and revision orthoplasty uh, from Australia. Uh, he's a great teacher and has won prestigious trainer of the year award in 2014. He's a deputy lead uh, to, for skills and simulation in Severin uh, Deanery. He's a faculty in the prestigious uh, Liturnal. I was just, I just learned that it's been called as a uh, European master course now and the AO Pelvic master course uh, UK. He's a co-conveyor of this world-famous Bristol Orthoplasty course uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Edward Smith and Mr. Anthony Ward. Uh, so he will decode today, you know, uh, tips and tricks of doing a totally replacement, an acute totally replacement after an acute acetabular fracture. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating concept, and we would love to uh, learn from Prof. Acharya about it. So uh, if you can unshare and share Prof. slide, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sri. Testing. Audio? Okay. Audio is okay. Something? Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Sri. Thank you um, for everyone who's here uh, for the meeting face to face. Thank you for the audio visual team as well. Um, it's difficult to try and coordinate all of this. Um, um when there's so many things going on all at once thank you for a, a great talk um by dr shah um you know talks like that um are inspiring because again what i said earlier i think these opportunities and adventures over the next two to three decades of your life um are amazing and uh and you know you'll you'll go through 10 years or you'll go through 15 years and you'll think about all the opportunities that uh, um, that have arisen and you look at the ones that you've taken but actually as as our friend Sri said um, everything happens for a reason so it doesn't mean that you leave everything for destiny to to guide you and take you you've got to put that effort in but actually taking all your opportunities, making the most of all your opportunities, um, 
will stand you in good stead um, and you'll do well in your profession. So um, thank you, Shri, for inviting me um, to Bangalore once more. Uh, the last time I was here was 2017 um, and we ran a, a pelvic course actually at the uh, MS uh, Ramaya Institute um, um, through one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sen, who's one of the pioneers in pelvic and acetabular surgery. So I'll spend the next sort of 30, 40 minutes just talking a little bit about um, acute total hip replacement uh, for acetabular fractures. And, you know, we are seeing, just like the hip fracture population, we are seeing a massive surge in fragility fractures. So we know that our patients are, so we all of us as doctors are doing our jobs. So we are making patients better, which is great. We are making them live longer, which is great. If patients live longer, they are more likely to have other problems. And one of the problems is fragility fractures. So fractures which occur um, without much trauma. And the problem is, is that you've got these patients who are um, mobile and to some extent independent, and then they have a fracture. And that fracture then changes everything, changes their life. And what we want to do as physicians, surgeons, you know, sons, brothers, daughters, et cetera, we want to try and get those patients back to what they were like before that injury, okay? And something that you may take away from the talk is that there's various ways of treating various fractures, but for that person who you want to get back to independent, there may be only one or two options, okay? And you've got to try and be in that position so that you can offer those um, uh, 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 various options to that patient so that they can have the best outcome. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, hip replacement in uh, acetabular fracture. But before we think about um, success, and that's what it is, you know, we all want to be successful. We all want to be the best at what we do. We need to understand the failures and we need to be able to learn from failure. So, you know, there's a, there's a saying there that says that actually there are no failures. It's just a road to success. So if you learn from all of your failures, you will succeed. You'll have knockbacks. You'll have people that um, say, well, actually, you know, um, um, that wasn't the right way to do it. But as long as you keep persevering, you will achieve success. And so this person here, this is a bit of um, fun, but, you know, this person um, has successfully managed to keep their head up. Um, uh, sitting through uh, one of my lectures, um, but they haven't succeeded because they've fallen asleep, okay? So it's important to understand uh, and achieve success. We need to understand failures. So we'll start with this case. So this is a pretty elderly lady, uh, 93 years old. She fell at home uh, from her bed, uh, isolated injury to her left side, She's got a few medical problems. So she's got some diabetes. She's got high blood pressure. Uh, she's got osteoporosis um, and she's got kidney disease as well. So prior to this, she was at home. She was independently mobile around the house. She couldn't manage stairs. OK, and now she's had this fall. So we see the hip. So we see the acetabular fracture. And we see that there's been a central dislocation or the hip has protruded through the acetabulum. And this is an isolated injury. So the things that we really want to know is what's the diagnosis? Is there a classification system? Do we need any further help to try and decide what this really is um, and how we're going to manage it? OK. So we get a CT scan. CT scans are very helpful because x-rays are good at showing most fracture lines. But in the elderly, 
you may not see all the fracture lines. You may not see the impaction. You may not see the true extent of the injury. And so the CT scan is really, really helpful. And so this CT scan here shows um, that the posterior pelvis looks okay, the left side and the right side. If we look through these cuts, we can see that there's a, a fracture through the anterior column here. We can see here that the hip has been medialized and that this part here, the quadrilateral surface, has been affected. If we look at these other cuts, so these coronal cuts now, what we see again is similar to the x-ray. We see the, the femoral head has been medialized, but the other thing we see is just here. So this bit of bone is, is about two centimeters further up than where it should be. It's been impacted in. And so if we want to try and reduce this fracture, we've got to think about trying to bring that impacted bone back, okay? And we see that on that cut as well there. We get some nice uh, 3D images as well, but it's important to understand from 3D images is that you may, they, they subtract some of the fracture lines. So you may not be able to see all the fracture lines. So just be aware, they give you great pictures, but they may not show you all the fracture lines. And so classifying this fracture, I've said there's a fracture in the anterior column here. I've said there's a fracture of the quadrilateral surface here. The posterior column looks intact. And I've also mentioned that there was some impaction of the acetabulum and there's femoral head impaction as well. Because if we go back to that, you can see that the femoral head is resting on that articular surface. So there will be some damage to that femoral head. So what are the options? Well, the options for this 93-year-old lady are, you can keep her in bed, it's a non-operative. You can apply some traction and that may help with the pain. You can give her some painkillers. But what happens to patients when we leave them in bed? They lose muscle mass very quickly, okay? They'll develop all sorts of other problems, so chest problems, deep vein thrombosis, They'll develop um, chest infections, urinary tract infections, and all those other problems as well. So, um, and we take that person who is independent and so in, in, in a social environment, you, and you've taken them out of that environment. So you've taken all of that away from that patient. Once we know, we've seen it so many times, when people lose their independence, they spiral down. Okay. So we want to try and prevent that. The other thing we can do is to think about fixing the fracture. We like fixing fractures, we love trauma. And so we've got to think about fixing that fracture, but we've got to understand that this 90 year old is very different to a 40 year old, okay? And a 40 year old or a 50 year old can manage crutches. They can manage to hop on one leg, okay? And get out of hospital. And they can do, they can understand all that and they can do all that. Whereas a 90 year old trying to get them to use crutches or a frame and not put any weight on one leg might be really challenging. And that's just one side of it. The bone quality may be different. And so you've got to think about how you're going to fix it. Does your fixation strategy change um, or not? Or are you going to do something different? So are you thinking about doing a small operation? Are you thinking about just firing some screws just to hold those bits of bone in place and help with the pain? But you've got to think again, are those percutaneous screws strong enough to let the patient walk on that fracture? And probably not. Okay. And then you've got to think about the other side of it. So it's all a spectrum. It starts with doing very little. And then the other end of the spectrum is doing something very big. And so fixation and a total hip replacement is two operations, isn't it, on one patient? So are, is the patient able to withstand that? Are you able to do that as a surgeon? Okay, so these are all the things we need to be thinking about. Okay, so those are the options. So this is what the patient has. Um, so 11 days post-operation, um, 
patient has uh, fixation of the acetabular fracture through an anterior approach, through an anterior intrapelvic approach. And you can see that there's a special um, plate which has been used with lots of screws at the top end, lots of screws at the bottom end. And the reduction doesn't look too bad, looks, looks good. Post-operative radiograph, it looks better than the initial one. The head has come out to some degree, but let's compare, you know, we've been given two of most things. So let's compare with the other side. Let's compare with that right side. And what we find is that that femoral head is still medialized a little bit. Okay. So they haven't managed to um, get that femoral head back to where it should be. So that sh should be here. And so the femoral head is still medial. So what do you do now? You get a CT scan and the CT scan shows that most of the fracture lines seem to be reduced. That looks good there. That looks good there. Um, but you can see that that quadrilateral surface, that bit still hasn't been quite reduced and the hip is still a little medial. And so this is what happens three weeks post-op. You see that the hip has continued to keep moving, medializing. Okay. And it's gone back to the position where it almost was before the operation. So this patient's been put through this operation to try and help with their pain and get them to walk. But actually, three weeks down the line, because of partly the reduction, partly the bone quality, the hip has gone back to where it was. So what do we do now? Just some other views showing that that hip has moved and you can see it's medialized there and we've lost reduction. Patient carries on for a bit longer. And so now four months down the line and now patient is really struggling. So persisting pain, immobility, um, a further migration of that hip. So what do we do now? Um, two options really are uh, to carry on and say that we'll do a, a delayed hip replacement or get on and do a hip replacement now. And the patient's in agony. They say, look, you know, I can't walk. Um, I've got so much pain. Um, I want something doing. So this is what I did. I did a hip replacement for her. Um, used some of her own femoral head to pack into the defects, into the graft there. Uh, put a, an acetabular cup with some screws um, and then a cemented stem. And she was delighted. You know, we've restored some biomechanics here. So look, the hips look almost similar. Lengths look pretty good. The offset looks pretty good. And so that's going to tension the muscles. That's going to allow the muscles to work properly and allow that patient to have the best functional outcome. So that's what we did for her. And so the question going back to the start then is, was this failure predictable? And if we look at it now, 90-year-old patient, low energy fall, osteoporosis, impaction both on the acetabulum and the femur, okay, uh, um, medialization of, of, of um, that femoral head and the quadrilateral plate fracture, those have four indicators. So all of those things put together, there are six or seven reasons why this was going to fail, okay? And so we could have predicted that and we could have said, well, actually, we'll give this patient a slightly bigger operation, do the fixation and the replacement all in one go. And we may have saved, you know, a few months in, in the rehabilitation process for that patient. Just a thought. Okay. So that's just focused our thought process into fixation of fractures, um, different types of fractures and failure as well. So if we look at um, these various series here, you can see that 10% of um, acetabular fractures which have been fixed will fail within two years, okay? And that's just because they're elderly, all those things that we mentioned, elderly, the fracture type, 
the impaction, all of that. If we look at a slightly longer period of time, so between five and 10 years, 25 to 30% of these patients may well need a hip replacement. So may get post-traumatic arthritis needing a hip replacement. And this is even higher where you've got the, the poor prognostic fractures. This is probably the, the largest and the longest series. So this is Matters series, um, looking at 810 patients up to 20 year survivorship. And even, so this is, these are all the cases done by him. And, you know, he's an excellent astabular surgeon. So even in his hands, the cumulative survivorship is 80% um, at 20 years. And so turning that the other way around, 20% of acetabular fractures, even in his hands, will fail, okay? And that's not because it's a bad surgeon, it's just because the fractures are bad and they may present late, they may have all those poor prognostic factors. So the poor prognostic factors, what are we looking out for? How can we predict when we look at these um, x-rays and scans? How can we predict which fractures are gonna fail? Well, we know because there's lots of literature out there, okay? And, uh, and I'm used to seeing x-rays, so I've put all of these together for you. So if you've got a patient who has a, a posterior wall fracture and a fracture dislocation, we know that has a poor prognos uh, prognosis. If there's a fracture involving the posterior wall and the posterior column with some impaction, that does badly. T-shaped fractures are, are inherently bad um, or difficult to fix and they do badly. And then the transverse posterior wall, that does badly. So there are certain groups of fractures that do badly. If they have impaction of the acetabulum or impaction or femoral head damage, again, these patients are gonna do badly. So already you've got a few prognostic indicators, which if you see on the X-ray and CT, you think, oh, okay, maybe I should do something else rather than just fixing this fracture. And then there are other things that are under our control. So quality of reduction is under our control. And so coming to meetings like this, going on courses, going on cadaveric courses where you learn the reduction techniques and the fixation techniques uh, uh, of paramount importance because this is where you, you perfect your surgical skills and you want to try and get that acetabular fracture fixed perfectly to get the best outcome if that's what you're hoping to achieve. There are some things we can't do anything about, but what we can do is to use the knowledge we know to make sure that that patient who's elderly has the right operation for them. And then there are other things as well. So some of these things aren't within our control. Um, sometimes patients present late from home. Sometimes they present late from other hospitals elsewhere. But what we can do is if we want to provide the best care for these patients, then what we can do is we can have a network like this. So if there's a fracture in, uh, if there's a patient with an acetabular fracture in Shree's hospital and Shree knows that it needs a, 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 an operation, then he could contact me who, who, who's going to fix that fracture and, and, and talk to me about it. And I can say, OK, we need to get on and do this within the next week or two weeks rather than leaving it for a month because it's going to be more difficult. It's not going to be possible to reduce it anatomically after about three or four weeks. So we need to get on and do it. So all that communication, and then you can improve the system in your own region, but also globally. And that's what's happened in the UK. So now in the UK, we have 22 major trauma centers all around the UK that deal with these types of injuries, specialist injuries. And so all the patients now come to those 22 centers so that they can be treated as early as possible by those specialists. Uh, so Tony Ward, um, yeah, one of my mentors, one of Shreem's mentors as well, um, spent some time in Pittsburgh uh, with Dana Mears, and they looked at um, a, a group of patients that had a delayed total hip replacement um, after an acetabular fracture. 
And most of the acetabular fractures were fixed through a, a big incision, an extensile approach. And what they found in those 55 patients is that over 50%, so 58% had radiographic loosening of the total hip replacement. And there was a 36% revision rate within three years of that total hip replacement. And the reasons for those um, um, revisions were loosening avascular necrosis. So we know that we see avascular necrosis on the femoral side, but it can also happen on the acetabular side. And so this was AVN on the acetabular side, then going on to loosening, dislocation, deep infection, and heterotopic ossification. Um, another study um, by Mears uh, a few years later, again, um, looked at acetabular fractures um, that were conservatively treated or operatively treated. And what they found is that actually the best fracture pattern to try and treat um, is, is one of minor displacement with union where you've had non-operative treatment. So what they said is that if you've got an acetabular fracture and it's been fixed, and then three years down the line, you do a hip replacement, that, pace, that patient does worse than if you've got an acetabular fracture, which has been left for three years and you do a hip replacement. So it's more challenging and the outcome is worse if you do a hip replacement in someone who's had it fixed a few years ago, okay? And similarly, with this study, this study showed the same thing. So they looked at three groups. So those that had failed open reduction internal fixation, so developed arthritis, those that just had closed reduction, so non-operative non treatment, and then they compared them to the primary osteoarthritic group. And what they found is that, again, the ones that had had an operation to fix the fracture, when they had a hip, they did worse than if you hadn't had a fixation, okay? And so this um, study just came out very, very recently, you know, just two months ago in February. So this is a, a meta-analysis. And what this looks at is all the studies um, in where patients have had an acute total hip replacement, so um, very early on as opposed to fixation and a delayed total head replacement. And these are the results. There are 255 patients, uh, 138 in the acute fix and replace group, and 117 in the delayed group. They found there was no functional difference um, uh, or complication rates between the two groups. But what they did find is that the revision rate was massively different. So the revision rate, um, in those that had the delayed operation was 17% compared to 4% in the early group. So again, it just makes you think that actually fixing something and doing a delayed hip replacement has, sh has shown in various studies to give you uh, a poorer outcome. And so doing a total hip replacement may be an option for specific patients in specific fracture types. And so this is what we do. So um, we do this either through one or two approaches, depending on the fracture type and depending on what needs to be fixed. We approximate the reduction of the columns and the walls, and we stabilize them. Um, it's, easy to, it's easier to rely, uh, realign the fractures when you've taken the femoral head out, because you can see inside and you can see whether you've reconstructed everything. You can use the femoral head as bone graft. So you, you can use a mill to mill it down, or you can use uh, some nibblers um, to make some croutons and pack that into the acetabulum. Um, and so once you've stabilized the columns, the anterior and the posterior column, then you can put a cup inside those columns. And I'll show you that schematically just now. There are potential problems. It is a more extensive procedure. So it is a longer procedure, increased infection risk, um, uh, increased risk of needing blood. Sometimes you have difficulty positioning the cup because there may be bone loss or there may be bits of the fracture that you can't fix. One of the things that it's difficult to try and get right is the leg length discrepancy and the offset. Um, and potentially there's a risk of dislocation. 
So this is a concept. These are the two columns. So you see the anterior column here, and you see the posterior column here. And so if the anterior column is broken, you fix the anterior column. If the posterior column is broken, you fix the posterior column. If they're both broken, you can fix them both through two approaches. And then you put a cup in the middle. And you can, and I tend to use a multi-hole cup so that I can put screws inside that cup to get fixation of the cup itself as well. And so we um, published our article just last year, um, 22, um, and this looked at our experience and our cohort of patients. And I'll run through the results um, of our paper. And so we had 77 patients. Uh, we were able to follow up 51 of those. Um, a few of um, the ones that were lost to follow up died. Um, you can see 15 of them died. A couple had dementia and some were lost to follow up. And so our mean follow up uh, was five years, but up to 12 years in some of the patients. Age range was 67. Uh, median time surgery was nine days. And we had a 9% uh, uh, complication rate or revision rate. So these are our uh, complications. So this just shows two um, uh, uh, tables, uh, one for the ones that were followed up and then one for all of the patients. Um, and you can see that, uh, yes, there are some dislocations, um, there are some infections, um, uh, and there are some revisions as well. If we look at the survival of um, our patients, then over 90% of them have survived at that 12-year um, uh, mark on that Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And if we look at their functional outcome, we see Oxford hip score, if they're up to 48, then that's a normally functioning hip. And so you see majority of our patients had a pretty good function. And then if you review the literature, you see that there are lots of studies looking at um, acute total hip replacement. And you can see our current study is the one down here. And that's probably the one that's um, got the largest number of patients. And it's the one that's been followed up to midterm. So that five, you know, uh, medium uh, of five years. So it is an option um, for specific types of patients. Um, we uh, ourselves in our unit have changed our, and we've evolved. So initially we started doing one approach, then we started using two approach for some fractures. And then for some of the really elderly patients, we've gone back to using one approach. So what I want to do now is to just maybe go through uh, a couple of cases to show you um, what we do, uh, what we can do with some of these fractures um, and what I've done with some of these cases. So I'll do that. Sri, how are we for time? Plenty of time. Okay, good. Um, make it interactive or not? Okay. So this is a 71-year-old paraglider and he collided onto a rock face, still paragliding at the age of uh, 71. And he had a traumatic fracture dislocation of his right hip. He went to one of the um, referring hospitals first with that x-ray. So anyone, what do we think? Posterior column. So yeah, so, uh, okay, good. So the posterior uh, wall, you're right, is here. And you can see that the hip is dislocated. So there's a dislocation. There's a posterior wall for a, a fragment there. The posterior column is this line here, isn't it? So that's the ilioischial line. That looks okay when you compare it to the other side. So the posterior column, we need a bit more information. Might um, get a CT to look at that. On the x-ray, it looks okay. On that x-ray, it looks okay. The anterior column, which is that line, the iliopectineal line, looks okay as well. Okay. Um, but as I said, it's dislocated. We've got um, uh, a big posterior wall fragment there. So we get those Jude views. And the Jude views, again, confirm now that the anterior column is intact. We see the posterior dislocation and the posterior wall. And then if we look at the other Jude view, the iliac oblique, we see the posterior column there looks intact. So that's a bit more information. So 
probably the posterior columns intact. So his initial treatment before he was referred to us, he had a closed reduction of his hip within six hours. Why do we want to reduce it quickly? AVN, that's right. So the longer we leave it out, the more difficult it is to reduce and um, the higher the risk of damaging the blood supply, AVN, that's right. So they, they reduced it. What they didn't realize is that it re-dislocated. So typically what we do is if patients are re being referred from other hospitals, we ask them to put a, a traction pin in to hold um, the hip in the reduced position so that they can transfer the patient. So patient was transferred to us um, 12 days later um, with the right hip still dislocated. So that's the CT there. We see the dislocated hip. We see the fracture. We see that the femoral head will have been damaged as well because it's resting on the remaining acetabulum there. So what are our treatment options for this patient? What can we do for them? We could... Yeah, we can fix the posterior wall. So you're right. But remember all those things. So I said that a posterior wall fracture dislocation is one of the poor prognostic fractures, especially if it's got impaction. He's elderly. He's over 70. Not really elderly, but he is over 70. The hip has been dislocated for a week and a half, two weeks. So the risk of AVN is going to be high. Okay, so think about that. Um, then there's femoral head damage as well. So all these factors, all of a sudden, you've got four or five reasons why that hip, even if you fix it perfectly, might fail. Okay, and it's 70, and we want to get in weight bearing as soon as possible. So you're right, you could go ahead and fix it, but this is what I did for him. So all through one approach, just a, a posterior approach. So I, I brought all the, the, um, the wall fragments down. I held them there with these uh, smaller screws. So 2.7 uh, uh, or 2.4 uh, screws. And then I put a posterior column plate um, with some screws and then a cup with some screws as well. And that allowed him to fully weight bear straight away, okay? Any questions about that case? No? Let's do another case. I've got, I've got four cases. So if we can get through them all, we should be able to get through them. Yeah. Um, again, uh, another patient in their 70s, 73-year-old this time, uh, very fit and well, um, cycles miles and miles, um, fell off his bicycle, um, injury to his left hip and his uh, humerus. So that's him there. So again, he's got a, a, a displaced acetabular fracture. You can see he's uh, got a dislocation, central dislocation of that femoral head. Part of the articular surface of the um, uh, acetabulum is here. That's the quadrilateral surface. You can see that the femoral head is um, lying on the edge of that acetabulum, so there will be some femoral head damage. Okay. So we get a CT scan and the CT scan confirms all of that. The, the acetabulum is pretty comminuted. It's in a few bits. Um, you can see the femoral head is being damaged there as well. So we've classified the fracture. I classified it as a, a both column, a low both column fracture going across here. Um, and you could see that on that previous CT. Yeah, so you can see it going across here, going across here. So both column acetabular fracture with a posterior wall fracture, which you can see here. And it's got the impaction of the dome and femoral head damage. So what are we going to do for this guy? So again, we could fix this guy. And most both column fractures, we try and fix from the front. But this one has a posterior wall with it as well. So it's very difficult to fix the posterior wall from the front. So for this guy, you might have to do two approaches to try and fix the acetabulum. You might have to do an approach through the front and you might have to do an approach through the back. Now, if you're gonna be doing two approaches in him and we know that his 
elderly, and we know that he's got acetabular impaction and femoral head impaction, then you've got to have something else available. So you've got to have, you may fix it, but you've got to have the option of a total hip replacement at the same time. So this is what I did for him. Uh, first, the anterior approach, that to reduce it. Okay. And then I turned him onto his side and did a posterior approach and then put a, a, a plate along the posterior column from there down to there and a cup with some screws again. And that's him there. So he's, it's a lot of metal there, as you can see. You know, he's had a plate there inside the pelvis, plates on the outside, and then a hip replacement. But with this, I can let him walk on it. He can get rid of his crutches when he wants to get rid of them. Whereas if I had only fixed it, then I would treat him for four to six weeks, touch weight bearing, and then four to six weeks partial weight bearing. So it would be two to three months before I let him fully weight bear. And he may not be able to do that. He may not want to do that. Okay. So that was him. This is a really interesting case, actually. So this is a 70-year-old female, severe rheumatoid arthritis. She's got pulmonary fibrosis, has been on steroids for a long period of time, um, has something called Sicker syndrome, character conjunctivitis sicker, um, a connective tissue disorder, um, and hypertension. So this is an x-ray um, uh, previous to a fall, okay? So this was her standard, this was her baseline. So she'd had a pelvic fracture before here, not an acetabular fracture, pelvic fracture here. She had a little pelvic fracture at the back there as well. So it's already telling you that she's probably got some degree of osteoporosis. Okay. This x-ray is before her injury. So she has an injury now. And she has that x-ray. And she's got pain in her left hip and unable to wait there. So can anyone see anything? Anyone? I'll just go back to the previous one. It's the left hip we're looking at. Okay, so look at the left hip and then go to that one. I should have put them side by side. Okay. So if you look at it, I'll just show you there again. There's a subtle change in the roof here. It's very, very subtle, okay? If we go back a slide, you'll see it. Look, that is nice and hemispherical, circular. And then watch on the other X-ray. It's just gone up there a little bit. See that? It's slight. It's, it, uh, it's not very obvious, but it's there. Okay, so this fracture hasn't moved very much. What are we gonna do? Are we going to manage it non-operatively? Who's for non-op treatment? Hasn't moved very much. Yeah, good. Yeah, non-op, good. Anyone else? Okay. Who's gonna think about treating it with percutaneous screws? Anyone? Yeah, well, percutaneous screws. Who's gonna think about doing anything else? Can we do anything else? Do we need to? Probably not, hasn't moved very much. What are we going to do um, about letting the patient wait there? Are we going to let her walk on it? Probably not. We're going to ask her to maybe transfer bed to chair, maybe mobilize with a frame, walking on the right side, taking the weight off the left. Okay. So that's exactly what you tell her to do, and she comes back. So two months later, same patient. Because look, you can see all the fractures of the pelvis from before, comes back, and that's what we've got now. So what do we do now? Yeah, so that's right. So, you know, this is the point. So you tell them that you don't want them to weight bear, but how are these elderly patients going to manage non-weight bearing? So she will put some weight on it. And this is what happens, or can happen, yeah? So this is what's happened to her, um, and she's struggling now. Um, so what now? Anyone? 
a difficult hip replacement now. It's not a primary hip replacement. It's complex now. So this is what I did for her. So um, again, all through one approach, a posterior approach. I fixed the, the back of the fracture with a posterior column plate. I used the femoral head. And if you look closely, you can see that femoral head there. So I impacted that femoral head as a bulk. I just put it in as a bulk allograft and uh, reamed it out so that the cup could fit inside. So there's the bulk allograft. And then I secured the bulk allograft with a column screw. So I fired a screw from the back to the front to hold that in place. And then I put some screws into the cup as well. And so that was her post-op. So go back to what she was like pre-op. Look at that, where she's got a leg length discrepancy. She's lost her offset. She's in pain. She's not able to wait bare. To that, where we've equalized her leg length, maybe a little bit short. We've given her some offset back. We've given her some stability so she can walk. And actually, it's great. So two years later, look at that. And now you see that the bone has incorporated up here and up here. And she looks good. So, yeah, she did pretty well. So that's something you can do. But it's understanding that if you decide to treat someone non-operatively, um, you need to see them sooner than two months. So you might need to see them at two weeks or four weeks to get another x-ray to make sure it hasn't moved. And if it has moved, then you've still got some time to do something about it sooner rather than later. Okay, last case then. So this is an even older woman, 86 now. Um, again, independent, walks five miles a day, quite a lot. And she fell from a standing height. So again, with her, she's got um, a low energy fracture. She's elderly. She's got a central dislocation. She's got some impaction of the acetabulum there. Um, and she's got, she will have some femoral head damage. This is her CT scan, and you quite clearly see the impaction here. And that's called the gull wing sign. So it looks like a seagull. So the normal acetabulum should be like so. But when a bit of it is impacted, it does that. And you see the seagull sign, the gull wing sign. And that's what you can see here, there. And you can see all that bit which has been impacted as well. So what are the options for this one? Again, my aim is to get her weight bearing fully if I can. So I'm thinking about um, performing a fixation and a replacement. And like I did with that other guy, um, you probably need to think about getting that back to there and maybe putting a plate on the inside again, and then a plate on the outside and then a hip. But that again means two approaches. It means about six hours of operating. She's 83. Is that the right thing for her? So more recently, over the last two to three years, we've been doing something, something different. And I'll show you what we did. But these are my aims. I wanted to sit out, pain relief, and I wanted to wait there. Okay. So this is what I did uh, for her. This was my plan. Lateral position. I had her on a, on, a, on a bean bag so that I could um, x-ray through that. I did a cocker Langenbeck approach. I fixed the posterior column. And then I did this um, uh, uh, special prosthesis, which is called a cone hemipelvis. And the reason for getting that scan there was to show that this bit of bone is intact. So she didn't have a fracture going up here. So this is the bone that I can rely on. And you'll see when I um, show you the, what the cone and pelvis looks like, you'll see that it gains fixation over there. So that was the plan. And so that's what I did. So I found my entry point for the cone and pelvis, and it's in that intact bit of bone. I prepped it up um, using a reamer. I, I then plated the posterior column and put that implant in. And you can see it there. And then I, put a, a, I did a trial reduction there with a the stem. And again, that's her post-op. So you see I've used a hybrid fixation. I've fixed the posterior column. I've put in this uh, cone prosthesis, but I've done this all through one approach now. 
I haven't done the two approaches. So actually something that would have taken maybe six hours has taken about three and a half hours. So I've shaved off two and a half hours of operating for this eight-year-old, which for her is great. Um, and so that's her three months. She's healing and she's good. And so I'll stop there and just summarize and then leave um, it open for some questions. But um, the things to really understand is that elderly osteoporotic fractures are increasing. We're seeing them all the time and we're going to see more for years and years. They are a challenging group of patients. You know, they find it difficult to non-weight bear. Their bone quality is different. They have lots of comorbidities. And so you've just got to think outside the box when you're managing these patients. Um, they, there is a higher failure rate with these patients. And so thinking about it, an acute total hip replacement for acetabular fracture can provide a good solution with good early to mid results, as we've shown in our study up to five years, um, with some going out to 12 years. Um, in patients who have poor prognostic fractures, the elderly osteoporotic patients, and those who have delayed presentations. So I'm going to stop there. Any questions anybody has? Dr. Raghavinda, you got any questions? Sir, uh, it was very interesting. Then uh, my question is, uh, doing with the bone grafts and in a stabler fracture, how do you maintain the biomechanics, uh, the offset and uh, the vertical heights uh, since it's uh, uncemented and uh, maintaining to the native uh, hip is very challenging. And uh, how do you maintain that after uh, incorporation of the grafts? Yeah, so so you're absolutely right. So the, the main problems with uh, doing this acutely is acetabular cup position, stability, um, offset, and length. And so what I try and do is I try and reconstruct the acetabulum in the socket as anatomically as I can, okay? And then I'll use other landmarks like the transverse acetabular ligament to tell me the version or the implant position. And I'm always cautious. So when I'm training my registrars, my fellows to do it, um, you know, usually when you put an uncemented cup in, you hold the handle and you give it a, a good hit and a tap. With the um, acetabular fractures, you don't. You, I, when they're reaming, I tell them where I want the cup to end. So it needs to stop on the rim. It doesn't need, it, it shouldn't sink down. So you should sit the cup right on the rim. And so if they're going to hit it and tap it in, um, I, I, I tell them they just have to do a gentle tap and get it onto the rim. And so that's really important when you're reaming to make sure you've got a rim fit and you leave that cup there. You don't medialize it too much. So that's the first thing. Um, on the offset uh, side, um, I tend to use uh, a cemented stem. I think it gives you a lot more versatility. So offset, um, version, and length. Whereas if you use a cementless stem, um, two problems. One, you can't control all of that, or you, you can't control it as easily. So you may have leg length problems. Offset might be fine, but you may have version problems. Um, and then the second risk is that these patients are elderly, so you can get um, femoral fractures. So I think using a cemented stem just gives you that versatility. And you can put the stem where you want, and you can try and match their um, offset and leg length and stability, all of that. But I think taking that one step further, if with these patients, if we could use the augmented reality and have um, that dynamic testing or dynamic reproduction of the opposite side, that would be fantastic because then you can match it perfectly. You can plan and match. Yeah. So that, you know, that's where I'm going with this. I think in certain fracture situations, um, 
we're again limited by the implants. Whereas if we had that 3D um, planning um, and execution, then we'd be able to match things much better, I think. I think Dr. Manisha is online. Uh, does Dr. Manisha has got anything to ask, uh, Prof. Acharya? Uh, uh, no, I, I completely agree with him that this will form the next frontier. Thank you. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, thanks, Ms. for a stunning presentation. I just want to ask regarding the, the cone processes, what you mentioned. Uh, what are the like uh, short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, results of the cone process? And how uh, is it like a monoblock construct, or do you just put the cone like an uncemented uh, construct, then put a uh, you know plastic uh, liner? How does it work? Yeah, very good. So um, it is uh, it. There was a, a cemented version, the Stanmore version, which was a monoblock, um, and it comes in three different sizes, three different lengths. Uh, I think two or three diameters, but they've stopped making that. So there is a modular one which can be used cemented or uncemented. So you could put the, the stem in and then you prepare for the body um, and the actual hemisphere, uh, uh, the cup part of it. And then you um, snap with this particular one, you snap fit uh, a dual mobility liner. And the reason why that's quite nice is because it's got a face changing liner so if you if you haven't because of the fracture put the cup where you want it you can change that face of uh, the cup by 15 degrees and it's a snap fit liner and then you put a dual mobility construct in um, and that comes in the cemented and the uncemented version now in one of the problems that um one of my colleagues has had is using an uncemented cone for fracture because again you're relying on um, uh, a, a nice fit and you can cause fractures and and that's what happened with them they had a fracture and they couldn't use the prosthesis so they had to bail out yeah um what are our results um so we have done i think 24 26 cases now um for all, uh, majority of them for astabular fractures, but I've done some for tumors as well. Um, and the results uh, in the short term, so three-year follow-up is pretty good. We've we've just got up, we've got a paper which we're just bringing out very soon. So they'll be out in print very good, very soon. This is from Imp Implant Cast, is it? Or what is it? That's right. So um, Stryker and Stanmore used to do the... Uh, previous cemented cone and implant cast um, a company that exists in the UK actually um, uh, yeah make the cone hemi pelvis yeah uh, talking about the impaction fractures or impaction of a stablum looks like uh, you can write a book on it so uh, can you just simplify uh, for the non pelvic guys you know uh, what are the different type of impaction and what's the treatment algorithm for that yeah so um if you think uh, it's it's difficult sometimes on x-rays um because if if there's the hip socket and this bit has gone up okay if if that piece has gone up through the fracture and the whole bit has gone up when you bring that fracture back that piece will come back so that's not true impaction that's called dome elevation or elevation of that piece of dome but if um, uh, impaction means that that bit of articular surface is crunched down, so like with a tibial plateau fracture where you get impaction and you see on the CT, you see that white sclerotic line where it's all impacted down. That's the bit that has the poor prognostic indicator. So if you see that and you could see that at the back with a posterior dislocation or in the roof, then you need to bring that back and you need to graft behind it. Um, uh, and there's various techniques to do it. But it, the key thing is, is separating those out between dome elevation and dome impaction. And the impaction needs to be restored like a plateau and graft behind it. The elevation just comes down with the fracture. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Mr. Javed? Just give it to you. 
thank you again and welcome to bangalore as well ah oh, perfect it was a fantastic talk i think the, though i'm from a non non healthcare provider i'm from a pharmaceutical company but i i got the work in those the presentation what you have made actually yeah uh, no. but one thing one thing i will mention one thing we haven't talked about is the importance of having the pharmaceuticals on board so having the medics yeah. to make sure that you know if they've got osteoporosis you treat them yes and they're on bone protection exactly. absolutely but anyway so basically that's such precisely what i wanted to ask you uh, when there is so much of massive upsurge in these fragility fractures and you need, and we all know that bone quality and osteoporosis act, is actually the culprit uh, so do you have any treatment algorithm of course yours your skillful hands can fix up that particular fracture and make the patient mobile and intact but still they are vulnerable towards uh, subsequent fractures from the other side and as well so do you have any uh, uh, algorithm treatment for osteoporosis per se how do yeah. you follow that yeah so in in general if uh, they are over 75 and they have a um, low energy fracture so uh, fracture from standing height falling down breaking their wrist or falling down breaking um, something then then by definition they've got osteoporosis so they uh, have treatment now if we have someone who is 65 but has a low energy fracture then we have a questionnaire so they fill out a questionnaire and it asks them things about um if they've had long term steroids if they've had um uh early menopause if they've had a hysterectomy so asks them all of that and then they have a score at the end and frax score absolutely yeah yeah you know yeah yeah so so they have a score and then depending on that we decide on which ones get a dexa scan and treatment so absolutely yeah we use that so not terry paratide um and i think the main reason for that is expense um yeah uh from LIU, yeah. so it's pretty expensive and uki is still not encouraging virus either side no so whether in india we have virus ah almost come over by 17 uh to what for approximately it's around uh you know um 750 us dollars yeah but in india it's still getting even with the longer uh maybe 150 or 75 us dollars no really yeah, so it's not a no it's a yes sir yeah sure 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 but i think that's that's the limiting factor so most will be on bisphosphonates um hardly any will be on teriparatide um and one of the problems we see with the bisphosphonates are the bisphosphonate fractures yes. so you know if you atypical fractures yeah so if you prevent 200 osteoporotic fractures you'll create one bisphosphonate fracture and so they're challenging to treat as well so there's an, another problem with them so you know if there's a way of um reducing their risk um which is cost effective then i think yeah that would be great cost compared to the main criteria you're saying i'm just asking no so in in private healthcare no but the uh, the the problem is is that um when you're providing treatment for 60 million people yes um i i agree i agree they've got to say yes and no to to certain things so yeah i wish i was the health minister <laughs> <laughs> yes i i i fully agree with you that uh, cost and economy does play a factor but it should not i frankly speak, uh, feel that it should not super speed the need for the treatment agree basically. so if the uh, bone quality is the culprit uh, there has to be some medication given to them i'm not talking about any brand specific per se no. sir no. based upon which are brand uh, they are available there uh, maybe yeah. they should seriously take concern about uh, what what should be the uh, uh, post uh, surgical treatment or anti osteoporotic uh, treatment for the patient looking into uh, the longevity of the patient and other aspects is concerned agree there are, there are a uh, certain medications available which can probably improve the quality of life of the patient in addition to the fantastic surgical work which you have been doing that as well so that's basically my thank you so let's set up a study then let's we set up can, a trial we can we can definitely that's the way to do it is evidence exactly yes. is you set up a trial you show them that actually you know you can 
um, uh, compliance is good yes. and um, and uh, the outcomes are good. And if you can show them that, yeah. then so there, is a, there is a 10 year data right now from Freedom Trial available when it comes to combination with tenosumab and periparatide. Okay. Uh, 10 year data and the results in terms of bone mineral density and maybe certain extent reducing down the risk of fractures also. Yeah. Data is very much forthcoming. I, I really do not know why, frankly, you know, yeah. basically uh, orthopedicians should get into this. India, they have got, but not into US and UK, frankly. That, that's probably still uh, uh, a gray area is there, actually speaking, when it comes to osteoporosis. In yeah, yeah. People. But in India, it is orthos who are majorly into osteoporosis because really? ultimately they have to uh, feel the, the you know the pain for treating very yeah. uh, uh, you know all the problems with the butter bones. That's right things, because it's the, their surgical outcome which actually gets uh, compromised. Yeah, and I agree. And you know you just have you just look at the cost of one implant. Yes, and you look at you know uh, uh, yeah teriparatide or something. Because, then because I, I I heard you also saying that one fracture can actually dislocate the patient for lifelong person mm. even after surgical intervention also yeah yeah so maybe uh, if there is something that we can do to prevent the second fracture that can always be agree uh, because this is not uh, you know we've talked about the surgical cost or the hospitalization cost but you take that person out of society yeah and then you need uh you know you need care you need 24 hour care maybe for that patient yeah. um and all of that so that the the other costs are just massive true, true. yeah Absolutely. It's good. Really Thank interesting. You. We can talk so for ages about this yes, 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 absolutely. over Thank dinner. So Thanks, David, for the excellent questions. I, I can just add my own Indian experience to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I had a patient uh, very badly osteoporotic. And in, in India, you know, uh, there's not infinite amount of money like the NHS where you can do operation A, it fails, you've got implants for B, then C. You don't have that. So you get one shot at that. And then I had a rep, uh, I don't want to name the company yeah. we're doing, and I always keep telling uh, my fellows that, you know, uh, bone is most weak in torsion. And when you just rotate, then it cracks. And uh, this guy was a company a man, and uh, while I'm reaming the, for the female, putting an exit stand. He just rotated, so and it cracked. So uh, and uh, what I didn't want really, what I keep on telling my junior that happened, and uh, I couldn't. He was from the implant company, very senior man, so I couldn't say much. So I said, okay, well, what do we do now? So, so we had the thing. So it's slightly longer stem we used, and then tried to bypass the thing, and uh, it was not. I know, I knew it was not two diameters uh, beyond, and I knew what's going to happen to this patient. Then I put this patient on teriparatide. And, you know, completely out of jail, it completely went on to heal, actually. So I think I had many similar examples where, you know, teleported has got me out of jail with very difficult revisions, both on a stabular side and femoral side. So that's my experience. Please don't mistake that we are promoting the No. It is this because you are not when it comes to surgical intervention and that. You are But then at times you also feel the patient, you know, you need certain tablets. So as far as the UK is concerned, you know, that's what Professor talking about evidence, set up a trial, prove that it's cost effective rather than, you know, the carers, isn't it? So, because all, all of our all of our treatments have to go through NICE. And so once you've got that evidence, every few years, there's a, a body, uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that sit together and look at all the evidence and see what's what. So if when they look at that evidence there is evidence for teriparatide um you know effectiveness and cost effectiveness and all of that or it, it's better than some of the other things or as good then i think that would um yeah make them change or have it on the guidance to say yeah, use it that's the problem so they create that guidance and then if you so it's something that they can hide behind that's the problem is that um, people can hide behind it and say, this is what they've guided us to do. That's all we're doing. We're not going to do anything else. The cost of therapy for this medication, whenever it's been talked, they seem it's going to be uh, very, very high. And if I have to probably uh, narrow it down, in India, per day cost of uh, uh, teriparative therapy is one pound. Really? But it's less than one pound. Wow. And teriparative therapy is less than 0.5 pound. Wow. Okay. That's that's how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the uh, biosimilars have actually come to the market, so that has brought down the. Uh, I, I, of course, effectiveness can always be debated. Yeah. I can always share with you definitely positive. Yeah, yeah. And India, it's like hundred rupees per day for therapy. 
Mm. Yeah, I need to know about these then. I think we should start exporting some of your medications back into the UK. I know. <laughs> yes. So thank you for the great presentation. Can I end the session? Uh, now it's time for uh, felicitating the faculties. So, uh, Dr. Raghavendra, if you can come here. Now put this chair there in the middle, please. Let's get this chair. Not, not, facing, not facing this one because the background is going to come a little bit away. Yeah. Prof. Acharya, if you can kindly come here, please. Yeah. Please be seated. I think we'll, we'll do this in a, a traditional Karnataka style. This is our uh, special from Bangalore. And uh, it always, uh, you know, uh, it comes from our state, uh, Mysore, which was uh, as well capital of the state, you know. And uh, we call it as a Mysore Peta. So, uh, <clears throat> that's how we honor all our guests, really. So, this is for you. <laughs> Thanks, Miss. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for coming all the way from UK. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, okay. thank, you. thank, you. thank 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 Thank you. 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 Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Please be seated. Yeah. Uh, request Srikant to come. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Put it in the back. Thank you very much. Thanks, Srikant. Thanks for coming. So, uh, you've okay. been a very good friend and uh, uh, although not a surgeon, uh, you know, fantastic acad academician. I learned a lot oh. about orthopedics from you. Pleasure. So, Pleasure. and now, you know, for all your effort, I'm using Merrill, your company's <laughs> impact. So, I thank can confess. Very and very well hosted this program. Okay, thank you. Fantastic learning. And I think thanks to Professor Mehmood as well. Uh, quite a lot of uh, insights on managing acetabular fractures and you know various options that you have given. Yeah. I think it's it's a wonderful learning for all the audience, and uh, wish you all well. And please continue to do this good work. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank thank you very much. much. Thank you, thanks for your encouragement. Thank you. Just a final bit, the word of thanks. So uh, go back to the slide again, please. Is the last slide. Yeah, I think we've done the felicitation already of Dr. Shaw online. Uh, so a uh, word of thanks. I take this opportunity to thank uh, all the distinguished uh, faculty, uh, particularly, uh, you know, uh, Professor Mehul Acharya for coming all the way from UK. Big round of applause to him. And Dr. Manisha for really taking us to the future of orthopedics. Uh, I really thank uh, my friend Dr. Neeraj uh, from Ortho TV, uh, you know, for uh, all the help. I really thank the AV team uh, uh, for all their help and the hotel staff as well. And uh, last but not the least, all the delegates uh, who are here. I saw the last count more than 150 or 200 in Ortho TV online. I thank those online delegates as well for being part of this program. Thank you very much. I think the uh, fellowship and dinner is upstairs in the restaurant, so we'll all move there shortly. Uh, Maharishi, thank you so much. Uh, you can go offline now on Ortho TV. Uh, thank you. Have a good day.